In a paper in 1926, Massing suggested that the shape of the stabilized hysteresis curve is a factor of two on the cyclic stress strain curve. Now that really isn't obvious, why should that be the case? I often get asked that question on fatigue training courses. Now Massing used a spring analogy to demonstrate this with 10 springs. In fact, many modern researchers use a similar approach, often with much more complex behavior, and this is often termed the discrete element method. Now I'm only going to use three springs, and I'm going to limit the response to elastic perfectly plastic. That's actually what Massing did as well. Now here are the three springs. They're set up in parallel, and they each have the same stiffness term, but they have a different yield level. So the first one is at level two, then three, and then four. Now these are just simple units, so we can just graph them very easily. So we can see the stiffness terms, we can see the stress, and we see the strain, just with very basic units. They don't represent SI units or US units. So now we're first going to look at the individual spring hysteresis loops. So here's spring number one. And the first action we see is the loading up to yield. Now there's a strain controlled loading up to the strain limit of 10 units, and the stress just stays the same. Now we unload elastically and end up with a residual strain of 5 units. Now we reverse the loading and we assume that this is isotropic hardening, so we end up with the same reverse stress level of 2 units. The reverse loading continues, don't forget it's strain controlled, and it goes down to a value of minus 10 units. Now we reverse the loading again and we go up the elastic curve of the spring until we hit the yield point again. Now the strain loading increases, we go through the initial yield point and finally to the total level of strain applied. And now we repeat the process for spring 2, which has a high yield stress of 3 units and the same stiffness. The hysteresis loop for spring 2 is skinnier than for spring 1, because there's less plasticity involved. Now we repeat the exercise for spring 3, but this remains elastic throughout the cycle because we don't reach the yield level of 4 units. And now we're going to combine the springs in parallel, and we're going to look at the cumulative effect of their stiffnesses added together, and also the different yield stresses that they have. So at the moment we're looking at spring 1, and we can see the loading and the unloading part of the curve. So now let's complete the hysteresis loop for spring number one. Now we add spring number two and we see that loading and then unloading. Now if we break this down and look carefully we can see the different parts of the curve that have been created. Initially the two curves are working together so they're doubling the stiffness. And then we hit the yield stress of spring one. So now we are left with just the residual stiffness of spring two so the slope changes. And now we hit the yield stress of spring two so we have zero stiffness, and the spring will extend to the strain limit that we apply. Now we unload elastically, and we're back to the double stiffness of spring one and spring two together. Now we continue to unload elastically until we get to the yield point of spring one again. On the next slope, the only contribution to stiffness is coming from spring two. Now spring two yields, and we're left with zero system stiffness. Now the spring continues to stretch, to the limit of the strain load that we're applying. Now we reverse the loading again, and initially we have an elastic response with the combined stiffness of the two springs. Spring 1 yields again, and then spring 2, and we run to the end of the strain loading. Now let's clear the hysteresis loop of spring 1 on its own from the picture. Now we're going to overlay or combine spring 3 into the system, and then look at the combined hysteresis response. First thing we'll do is load and unload. We start off elastically with the three combined stiffnesses, then spring one yields and we have a drop in the stiffness, spring two yields and we have a further drop in the stiffness, and finally we have an elastic response as we unload. Now as we unload further, we get an initial drop in stiffness from spring one and a second drop in stiffness from spring two. A further loading reversal gives us an initial elastic response and then two successive drops in stiffness as we hit first again yield of spring one and then a spring 2. So now let's tidy up and look at the combined hysteresis loop for springs 1, 2 and 3 in parallel. So here is our material stress strain curve. Hopefully it will be cyclic data, but if not then we use monotonic data. And here is the hysteresis curve, which again we assume to be stabilized. 
Now we're going to compare the two curves. The first thing I'm going to do is to move the stress strain curve down to the common origin with a hysteresis curve. Now we can compare the units, 10 units of strain for the stress strain curve, 20 units for the hysteresis curve. So that's double on the strain. Now if we look at the stress, there are 9 units for the stress strain curve and there are 18 units for the hysteresis curve. So the massing hypothesis that both the stress and the strain are doubled so we have a double curve shape for the hysteresis curve. We can show that quite simply in this geometric way.